future. So thank you guys. So I'm building the love already. Um, so you've heard a little bit about me. Mostly what I like to tell people is I used to be a designer. So I get you guys really well. Um, I understand how important design is and I really believe in the value of design. This is why I ended up not being a designer because I sucked at it. And what I'm really good at is the business end. So I ended up kind of transitioning a very long time ago uh, to, to the business of design. And I get to work with like amazing people because designers like you're awesome, right? And so I get I get to work in something I love and with people I love. So uh, and basically I help the business. Anything with business, I'm there for you. That's what I do. It's pretty easy. Um, so we're going to talk about love. Um, and the reason why I developed this talk, yes? I have to go like this. Thank you, Mateo. Okay. Already I'm screwing up. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I want to talk about love. And this is this talk came out of a desire, because I do very tactical talks. I'm very interested in making sure that you're profitable and that you you know, can manage clients and manage projects. But a lot of people were like, we need some inspirational talks from you. So this is my attempt at inspiration. <laughs> uh, not sure how I'm going to do, but we'll try. Uh, so I want to talk about love. And love is about, to me, about building connections. It's not really about passion. It's more about making sure that we love each other and that we know each other. Because I think in this day and age, we've lost that connection, right? We don't talk to each other. We're always, you know, on Instagram. Even like, even people in the same room, they're texting each other and they're not talking. So I want to go back to, and this is not because I'm old. It's more because I really feel like that is hurting our business, that we're not talking to clients, we're avoiding clients like the plague, clients are avoiding us. And if we just start talking to each other and building the love, I think our businesses will get stronger. Uh, so why is it important business? Because it really is important business. Uh, it's first, you must love yourself. So if you don't love what you're doing, it's going to be very, very hard for you to sell. And very hard to talk to clients, very hard to get your, your team inspired. So the first thing is just love yourself. And if, if, not, if you're not there, you need to build the love for yourself. And that's in terms of being pr prideful of the work you're doing and in the value you provide. Because I think a lot of designers, you're a little too modest. <laughs> and I sort of want you to embrace your prima donna, right? Be proud of the work you do, and, and, and don't question it, and, and be able to sell it in a way that really speaks to yourself. So first, you must love yourself. Then you have to love your business vision. And this is about knowing where you're going in the future. So if you don't know where you're going in the future, then you're just responding to the fires, right? So how many of you are just firefighting all day long? You're all lying, because there's no answer. <laughs> you're not? Uh, if you're not lying, well, because you're the only one who didn't lie. <laughs> no one else raised their hand. Um, so a lot of times we're just crazy, like responding to client requests, and we're fighting fires, and we're not thinking, where are we going? Where do I want to go? Where is my business going? What kind of work do I want to do? What kind of staff do I want? What kind of culture do I want? These are things that you have to think about and take time to think about, right? You can't just fight fires all day long because your business is going to be at the will of your clients, and you're allowing your clients to drive the business rather than you should be driving the business. So this is why building the love is really important in your business. Um, and finally, you should need to love everybody you work with, including, I know this is going to be amazing, clients. <laughs> right? We need to love the clients. And I'm going to hopefully teach you how to do that. Because they're all assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so first, I know this is really stupid, but I really want you guys to do this. How many of you are sitting next to somebody you don't know? I want you to just introduce yourself to somebody, because I think that's what we don't do when we sit next to each other. Like, have you been at an event and not talk to anybody next to you? So one second, just introduce yourself. Okay, that's happening. Okay, ready? No. So you're having more fun now. This is great, right? <laughs> I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so this is the core part. It's just meeting people, because we all go to conferences and we don't talk to anybody. It's really about talking to people. I have this famous story that um, I was in the elevator, and I was at a conference in Toronto. I was in the elevator, and there were like 10 dudes in the elevator, and this other woman, and she had a New York City bag, and she was on the other end of the, on the, other end of the elevator. 
And I'm like, oh, are you from New York? And she goes, yeah. I said, I'm from New York. And she goes, what are you here for? I said, a conference. She goes, are you here for the design conference? And I said, yes. And she goes, are you a speaker? And I'm like, yes. And she goes, I'm a speaker. And now we're getting really excited. <laughs> we're all like really excited. She goes, what's your name? And I said, my name's Emily. Then she starts jumping up and down. My name's Emily. <laughs> and this is all like through the elevator, like really going fast. And my, I'm, and the, my door opens and she's like, do you want dinner now? I'm like, sure. And so I met her in the lobby, and now she's a good friend, right? And she possibly will be a client one day, or not. It's fine. <laughs> right? So it's about making connections. I met clients in the, in the subway once. That's a whole other story. So it's, it's just talking to people and making connections. Um, I want to ask you some questions. Uh, first, do you like what you do? That's really important to think about. Do you like what you do? Because if you don't like what you do, then your clients are not going to like what you do. Right? Uh, do you like who you work for or work with? So it's, it's staff, it's clients. I'm actually doing a talk in Toronto again. Um, and this is my favorite talk. I can't wait to do it. It's called uh, It's Your Fault. <laughs> and it's about how we blame clients for everything when a lot of it is stuff that we can control. Right? So this, sort of, this talk will help you with that. But you should really love your clients, or like them at least. Maybe I won't go to love. Um, and do you want more work? Right? We all want more work, but we want the kind of work that we want to do. And so hoping building the love will teach you how to do that. Um, so building the love, and love is in, reflected in all kinds of areas of your business. It's in definitely in your culture. right? Um, so I have some good stories about culture. Uh, my daughter works in an advertising agency in California. So she's like a, you know, at the ground floor. She's like a newbie. And, She's being treated like shit. And, uh, and they, they really emphasize culture, right? So they're like, oh, we have yoga classes, and we have book clubs, right? Uh, and they went to the beach, and they're all excited. They're going to go to the beach because it's in LA. And they have summer Fridays. But their summer Fridays, this is the cracks me up, is you actually work half the day, but then the other half the day, you can work wherever you want, but you don't have the half day off. <laughs> <laughs> That's not summer Fridays. So they decide to go to the beach because it's culture building and they want to you know, force people to like each other. And they're, all, they're actually really excited. They're all excited about the beach until they find out that they have to go in the morning, and, which is an hour from where they work. So they have to somehow get to the beach in, in LA. That's not fun. An hour, come back, and then they have to work in the afternoon. That's not culture building. That's doing the absolute opposite. So rather than building love, they got people pissed, right? Uh, my husband, on the other hand, works for a company. It's a 100-person company. And when he started there, I won't tell you how long ago, I was pregnant. And I was a pre-existing condition, so his health insurance didn't pay for my pregnancy. It's a lot of money. His company offered to pay for the whole thing. He was only there a week. My husband will never quit that job, ever. Every time I ask him, he's like, no, they paid for your pregnancy. <laughs> I, he has loyalty because of that one gesture, right? That's culture building. Uh, daily interactions, how you talk to people, how you're engaging with people, do you respect them, are you talking to them? How do you treat people? Are that kind of, that, how you build love is how you're talking to people and how you're engaging with them. I think uh, the tone of voice, I have trouble with that one. <laughs> Some of my clients would say it. <laughs> Uh, so you have to concentrate on like what you're saying and how you're saying it and make it sound in a way that builds the love, right? So rather than being abrasive, think about how can I rephrase it? And a lot of times it's about breathing first and not responding in anger and just thinking about what you want to communicate and what's the best way to communicate. My favorite uh, recommendations for communicating, especially with tone of voice, is not to ever finger point. So if you have to confront somebody, never use their name. Always say it's about the situation, right? And because the minute you blame somebody, the minute they, get, they will get very defensive. Right? So it's about those kind of personal interactions. It's about body language. Right? So if you're crossed, you know, I have, my husband says I, have a, I don't have a poker face. Uh, and, you know, I have to be careful of that. Like, my face shows exactly what I'm thinking. And so you have to be very careful about what you're expressing through your body language. Because that also expresses love. And then also you have to love the work, right? And you have to love your prices, and you have to love the value that you provide. 
right? I have a great story. I want to remember the story because I always forget it. Um, oh, yes. So, um, not in our industry, but I read this um, article about snapper lawnmowers. So, snapper lawnmowers is probably the top tier of lawnmowers, and Walmart wanted to sell their lawnmowers. But they were too expensive for Walmart buyers, and so they asked snapper to sell them cheaper, and in order for them to do that, they would have a reduced quality. And because they had a business vision, they actually said no to Walmart. Because they didn't want to reduce the price and they didn't want to reduce the quality, because they stayed on their business vision and they stayed true to their prices. And I think that's an amazing story. And eventually Walmart came back to them and they were able to make a deal where they didn't have to sacrifice price for quality. Right? So I think those are things we can get inspired by. I think looking at other businesses also inspires me. I think what other people are doing are things that we can do in our own business. So I'm going to give you some strategies for building the love. Uh, first, you have to be you. You have to do you. So I'm not a big believer in being fake, as you probably can tell. Um, I really believe in just being authentic. If you are who you are, then they will love you. Right? And if they don't like you, then they shouldn't be working with you. It's sort of your pre-qualifier. If clients don't like you, you can't convince them to like you. Because then eventually your true personality will come out. So I really believe in just being your authentic self. So I'm sort of very direct, and I just embrace it, right? I finally realize that's who I am. I'm brutally honest, and I tell people that. So if they are in the South, they probably will not work with me. <laughs> I had one client in the South, in Atlanta. Uh, you have to absolutely love what you do and show it. Um, every time I work with clients, they the first thing I want to make sure is that they do good work, because I can't help them if their work sucks. Right? So your work has to be the best, and that's through building love. You have to love what you do, and that's going to show in the, work, in the quality of work that you do. It's going to shine through. You have to make your clients look good. So whatever you can do to make them look good, because then they'll be your advocates. If you make them look bad, if you're late, to, you know, you're late to a meeting, or if you're dressed poorly, or if you're late in presenting stuff, that makes them look bad. And if the work is not solving the client's problems, they're not gonna be your advocate. So the most important thing is to make sure that you, I know these seems obvious things, but I don't think they are as obvious. I'm so amazed every time I work with clients that some of this stuff is not as obvious as it seems to me. Um, so just make your clients look good. And then you have to show that through a measurable impact, which means metrics. I know you guys hate metrics. But that means proving, because designer clients the way they see things is through ROI, return on investment, right? So you have to prove, how do you prove through metrics or through other ways that your work has value? It's not just because it's cool or because it won design awards. Sorry, GDC. You know, that, those kinds of awards are really for our, our industry and for hiring staff. It's not for clients. Clients could give a damn if you've won any of those awards. What they care about is industry awards, right? So you want to make sure that you're doing things that the clients see that they have value. I, my favorite tactic is to ask to speak with them on stage. You know, if you want to talk to, with them on stage or meet the people they meet with and make them look good, they love that. So as much as possible, you want to make sure that your clients adore you through that, through having measurements like did, did this uh, increased event by attendance by this percentage, or did it, you know, one of my favorite stories is like hospitality, right? So if you're doing a hotel, have they, one of the metrics might be like, how many rooms do you need to book for, for the, the year. And that would be a goal to say we want to increase bookings by this percentage, right? Um, those are important metrics. Now designers hate metrics because what you fear is not succeeding, right? And this is gonna go to one of my recommendations later, which is to say, if you fail, if something went wrong and you didn't succeed, then you should embrace that and admit your mistakes because clients love that. They wanna know what they can do better and they would appreciate being told honestly that something didn't go right, let's figure out what, what could be better. How, do, how can you improve? What, what are the things that maybe you did? And what are the things that we could do better? Right? Uh, so you have to demonstrate your value at all interactions. At all interactions, whenever you're engaging with anybody in the elevator, you know, in this, in this meeting, in anywhere, you should really demonstrate your value. Talk about how much you love it and show that love. 
end, I know this is a hard one for designers, you have to be reliable. They have to be depending on you, and this goes back to schedules and budgets and keeping to everybody's agree agreements, making sure that you adhere to what you promise and being somebody they can depend on. That doesn't mean they can walk all over you. Right, because all of you are mostly people pleasers. And I'm gonna try to say that that is not building the love. That's kind of doing the opposite. So be reliable. I feel like I'm walking very fast. I also want you to communicate often and face to face. So if you have tough conversations, you should speak to them directly. Either if you have to, if they're long distance, then by Skype or by video chat. So anytime you can talk to the client face to face, that's building a love. So before you write a proposal, you should have met them. Because the number one reason why clients select designers is not because you're awesome, I'm sorry. It's not because your work is great. It's not because your work is awesome, sorry. And it's not because your price. I know you think you spend so much time worrying about your price. The number one reason why clients select you is they love you. And the way they love you is a lot of different reasons. One, you come as an expert, so you know their business really well, they've seen you speak, or they know who your clients are, you work with big name clients, and they're like, oh, she works with blah, 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 that means you know, she must be awesome. Um, it's also about just, just being a nice person and then liking you, but it comes through referrals, right? So most of us get our business through referrals and that's building love. Other people love you and they're expressing that love and sharing that love with other people, right? So it's about building those connections and you can't run a business without having face-to-face. -face. And I know we're all so busy and it's so much easier just to email people, but I would recommend that you really try to make those more connections. There's strategies where you could dump, you have no email Fridays. Has anybody heard of that? I love that, which is just say, ban emails on Fridays, the entire office. And it forces people to talk to each other and to talk to clients. And you even tell the clients, we don't do emails on Fridays. Big companies are doing it. I've seen design firms do it. It's fantastic and it's starting to make people, especially millennials, they have a tendency not to want to talk uh, face to face. Um, so it's really important to kind of train them to, to have these kind of interpersonal connections, right? No. Uh, you could do like, you know, FaceTime if you want, but somehow you want that body language. You want to see their facial expressions, right? Facial expressions, have you ever talked to a client and you don't know what they're thinking? And then the one thing that we all do is we make assumptions about what they're thinking, right? And in our head we're like, oh, they didn't like, I didn't do that well, or, but you don't know because you didn't see them. The minute you see their expression, you know exactly what they're thinking, right? So even when you're talking about budgets, you need to talk face to face. Because if a client, if you say to them what the budget is, and you start talking about numbers, and you throw out a number, and if they go, oh, that's fine, then you know you priced too low because you said it, so they said it so quickly, like, yeah, that's fine. But if they say, holy shit, or if they go, you know, like there's a deep breath, right? So that you can see that the price is too high. So having conversations even about budget and seeing that body language helps you to understand how to talk about numbers, right? It gives you an immediate reaction. Uh, and here's a big one, you need to support everybody you know. So whenever my clients are speaking, I try to see them speak. I wanna be in the front row supporting them. I think that's really important. They love to know that people care about them. And I truly am, again, going back to authentic, I do care about them, I'm not faking it, right? I really want to see my clients succeed. I want to see if they're speaking well. I want to see how they're communicating about their business. And so as many times as your clients are speaking or if they wrote an article, share it on social media, talk about their achievements, that's really important. And, and be very um, proud of all the stuff that they're doing. And they will love you even more. And it's, again, not fake. It's not this kind of like kiss-ass stuff, do you know the difference, right? It's more authentic. It's really like truly loving your clients and supporting whatever they do. Um, gotta laugh, right? I know women hate to say, be told to smile more often, so I'm not gonna tell the women in the room to smile. But um, 
you know, just be, try, even force yourself. My daughter um, sort of always looks miserable. She's like my husband. Uh, I'll talk about my personal life later. Uh, they always look mean, right, and mad. And I tried to get her to smile for a week. Just smile, even though she didn't feel it, right? And she started believing in the smile, and she started feeling happier. And that showed through her interactions with her, with her teachers especially. So try to laugh a little bit and have some fun in life. Take a vacation. Uh, be confident. If you're not confident, people are going to detect that right away and take advantage of that. Right? So be confident in who you are, in the work you do, and in everything you're providing, your clients and your staff. Believe in what you're doing. If you don't believe in what you do, it's going to come through. It's going to shine through that you don't believe in that, and that's not going to help build the love. Now, this is for the dudes in the room. Uh, and some women. You have to own up to your mistakes. So this is famous. Um, I think it's about being honest and being able to say you're sorry when you make mistakes. Uh, and just being honest, and this is not about saying sorry, but there's a, a story um, about... I forgot the guy's name, Dara somebody, uh, who um, became the CEO of Uber, right? And he left the company. Do you remember what company he was working for? I can't remember. I can't remember. Does anybody know? So he was working for another company, and they were really surprised he left to go to Uber because Uber was a disaster and had a lot of uh, PR issues. And he said, you know, I'm kind of terrified. I don't know if this is the right decision. He literally said that to his company to everybody. I don't know if what I'm doing is smart. I'm a little scared, but I want to take this risk. And I love that he was so, I mean, a CEO being that honest. And that built the love with all his ex-employees. And I'm sure that wherever he goes, they want to be with him because he was so honest and direct about that. Right? People want to know how you're feeling rather than trying to make assumptions. So own up to your fears and to your mistakes, especially with clients. So if you fuck up, just say that. Just say, look, here is the plan, here's how I'm gonna fix it, and I'm ready, I'm gonna do this, and I really feel bad, and I'm gonna fix it. But if you, a lot of designers do this, they sort of make excuses, right? Or they, they pretend it's the printer's fault or other kinds of fault. If you make a mistake, it's perfectly okay to say, hey, I'm a mistake, I made a mistake, I'm gonna fix this, this is how I'm gonna do it. And people really will respect you more for that. And that goes back to the metrics, right? So if what you did didn't succeed, work with them to figure out how can we have better succeeded. Rather than firing you, they'll be like, oh, they have some ideas, let's do this. I wanna take a chance with them because I understand what they did wrong and we're gonna fix it, <laughs> right? And it might not even just be themselves, it might be that the clients also can improve, right? So I'm a big fan of the postmortems. Has anybody done postmortems after a project's over? They're fantastic. So postmortems are once a project's over, you can meet with your staff internally to discuss what went well, what went wrong. Like, this was an asshole client, but somehow this worked really well this time. What did we do differently that made this client work with us better? What's happening? What's changed in their lives? What have we changed? How did we work better? And if things didn't work out, how can we have gotten better, right? So constantly, constantly looking back and saying, how can we improve? And then you do this with the clients, which is to say, let's talk about the project, how did it, you like working with our team? Did we you know, succeed in doing the meeting your business objectives? Really having honest conversations with clients. Um, we're all really busy right now and no one takes time for this, right? They're done with the project, they move on. But if you connect with them a month later and just say, now that the project's done and we all can breathe and we're a little less stressful, I'd love to have coffee with you and talk about how the project went. And that's building the love. It doesn't mean they're always gonna meet with you, but if you at least show that effort, they're gonna love that. They're gonna love that you wanna talk to them and stay in touch with them and find out how you can do better and how you can, what's, what's happening next. Does that make sense? Right, so staying in touch with people and building that relationship. And admitting when you make mistakes is really important. And be honest, which I talked about. Honesty is huge, but I'm one of my kind of core beliefs. Um, I think it's so helpful to just be direct with people rather than trying to be passive aggressive. Passive aggressive is not honest. It's the opposite. Uh, it's framing it in a way that's true, right? 
it doesn't mean you have to be an asshole. It just means framing it in the right way that's authentic, but that is safe. And here's a big one, say thank you. So I don't know how many of you are looking for jobs or when you interview, as soon as you leave that interview, send them a thank you note. If you meet with a client, drop them an email saying it was great talking to you. Now, if you don't like them, then you don't want to build the love. Build the love with the people that you like, right? So saying thank you goes a long way. I'm a big believer in um, referring people and building connections with people. I love connecting people, all random kind of people, all the time. Pretty much every day I'm re recommending people and connecting people. Um, and I'm not making money from that. And I'm not doing that any way to get uh, clients. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for them. I really am. If I like them, I'll do it for them. Uh, if they built the love with me. So one of those things is if my clients don't say thank you to me, that drives me crazy. I'm like, say thank you. And I'm gonna help you as much as I possibly can. I will drop heaven and earth to help you if you say thank you, right? Um, and so it's really about being kind to the person and, and helping each other out. So you, you ever recommend somebody and somebody, like client recommends business and they want money, they want like a referral fee? I don't believe in that. I think we all should just be helping each other out. And that to me doesn't build the love. That's, there's another reason for that. And it's, it's about their profitability or they're feeling good about themselves. And it should be just like, hey, I love you and I love this person, you should meet. So as much as you can build connections, that builds the love. And the more that comes, love multiplies. It's actually one of my slides. Um, and stay in touch. So designers, you have a tendency, once the project's done, you're like moving on to the next fire. Uh, and it's really about staying in touch with everybody you know. Everybody you know, so your mailing list should not be like 2,000 names. Because you can't know 2,000 people. You should know like 500 people. And so everybody on your mailing list should be people that you know and you've met somehow. And you've built the love with them, right? So it's making sure that you are um, building authentic connections with people that you love and that they love you. Um, and But staying in touch and not forgetting they're out there. Uh, I have a, a perfect story of this. I have a client that um, did designed a bakery. That was a bakery? No, it was a tea shop. And uh, it was gonna be the first in a launch of several tea shops. And uh, she did, she branded their tea, all their packaging, and the and the, lo the retail location, the brick and mortar location. Did a lot of work for them, had a really great relationship with the client. The project was over, but she knew that they were gonna open several more restaurants, so she needed to stay in touch. And for this has happened, so the restaurant wants, let's give you an example. It's, launched, I think it was in August. In October, she hears from the client that they don't want to ever work with her again. And she was like, why? What happened? And they're like, because you didn't stay in touch with us. I don't think you care about my business. He was like, two months later, he wanted to stay in touch. Even though there was no work, he wanted to hear from her, right? And in fact, she went to the tea house a few times, but never told him. So she didn't see him when, he, when she went there, and she should have dropped a note and said, hey, I went to your tea house. I was, I'm so happy you're so busy. That was awesome. But she didn't do that, and she lost a great opportunity just to simply make those connections. And again, about rewarding clients for what they're doing and celebrating their success. And so she lost a client who just felt like they needed just connection in two months, which is crazy, right? The guy needed a little needy, but still. <laughs> a little needy. But, but that, that, I think, is a perfect example of how people really do need those connections. They want you to stay in touch and, and share in their, in their success. So that means, like, after a project's over, maybe six months later, or the website's launched, or whatever you've designed, call them back and say, hey, how did it go? I haven't spoken to you, I just want to see, how's, how's everything going? You know, I do, um, I, well, I don't do this a lot anymore, but I write proposals for my clients, several of my clients, and I just want to know, did they win the project? Like, I want to know, like, if you don't tell me you won the project, then I don't learn and I don't get it. I, I feel like I want to learn from their successes, right? But I also just want to feel happy that they won. And I want to know why they didn't win and help them, right? So it's really staying in touch with your clients and asking these really important questions. How their business is doing, if they're pregnant, you know, put it in your calendar, check in when they're, when they're due. I know exactly what's happening in my clients' lives and I care about their lives. So if their kid's going to college or if there's big changes in their life, 
I'm reconnecting and saying, hey, how's it going? Right? Or if they had a trade show, how'd the trade show go? Right? That's building the love. And that's staying in touch. That's really important. I think a lot of us just, we have a client and we think it's done. Right? Okay, we lost the rent, we launched the restaurant, there's no work. But they might refer you to other people. There's always opportunities, so you should still stay in touch with them. And also, the other thing is new business takes two years. Two years to build from when you meet them to when they turn into clients. It's a magical number. I'm telling you it's true. When I speak, you know, I'm speaking a little bit to get clients. Um, I'll be honest. And uh, now I'm here to sell books, which is weird. Um, and almost always, there's somebody in the audience who two years later calls me up and says, I saw you speak at this event, and they know exactly what event, which is crazy. And they turn into clients two years later. So I'm never here to win clients right away, because if I'm doing that, if you're trying to win clients right away, then you're not, you're behaving differently. You sound a little kind of, e you sound a little over eager, right? So if you talk to people like a human being, rather than as a potential prospect, you will treat them differently and you will build a lot better. That you will be just a human being. And if you don't, I think a lot of people, they go to these new business meetings and they're so over eager to win the relationship, they don't spend time building the relationship. They're more talking about the work and they're not really trying to make connections. So like when you're in a meeting, I really like starting with meetings to go around the room and asking people, you know, especially in new presentations or new business pitches, like who's everybody in the room? What do they care about most about this project? And trying to then tailor your presentation to respond to everybody in the room, right? So if somebody mentions an issue, you can say, oh, Bob, you just talked about this. This is a perfect time to talk about that issue you were concerned about. So making that connection, I even try to make connections when I'm speaking to the audience to see if I spoke to somebody pre beforehand, I'm making eye contact because I talked to them about something and I want to make sure they heard that part of the presentation because we were just talking about it. So it's really important to make those kind of connections. Um, I'm just rambling now. Okay, so when you build the love, these are things that happen. And they really do happen, I'm telling you the truth. Clients will become your advocates. Right, so if you make a mistake, they'll defend you to, to their upper management. Right, if you've made them look good, that'll be great, but if you make a mistake and they still love you, they will defend you. If you charge too much and they, will, and they still wanna work with you because they've built the love, then you just talk about budget. It's like, if they, have you ever had a client where they know they're gonna work with you and they just say, hey, you're too high, let's talk about it. Because you've built the love. If you didn't build the love, they're not going to have that conversation. You'll never hear from them again. A lot of times when my clients don't hear from the clients again, it's because they haven't really built that relationship. They didn't talk to them in person. They didn't, whatever, go the extra mile. So if it's a project that's a lot of money, you might want to visit them. Like, go, go visit them. So I had a client um, that was up for a project in um, about like three, three states over. And... Uh, it was a big project, it was a two year project, and they were up against 20 firms, 20 firms. There was no way they were gonna win this project. And it was an RFP, which is very scary, uh, request for proposal for those that don't know. And I said, you should meet them in person. Now with most RFPs, you can't, right? But don't make that assumption. I said, just ask them, can you meet with them in person? And the client said, sure. So they drove out there. It took a you know a good trip to get out there. They made the effort to meet with that client, and of the 20 firms, they were the only ones, the only ones that made an effort to meet the client. And they won the project, even though their fee was one of the higher numbers. And the reason why they won, they said this, the client said this, is because you came out and met with us. You made the effort to come and meet us. That's really, really important. So clients will become your advocates and defend you. Um, Clients will send you thank you notes after working with you. Has anybody ever gotten a thank you note from a client? Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, but if you've built the love, you'll get more of those, I promise you. Right? They will send you gifts. Right? You don't have to take them out to dinner, they take you out to dinner. Right? So it's really, if you do those kinds of things, you're gonna be rewarded in so many ways. So many ways. Um, and clients, 
will then refer you. Wherever they move, they will continue to take you along for the ride. Now, sometimes they take you along for the ride because you're a pushover. Right, so you don't want to be taking, you don't want to be constantly getting referrals that are bad referrals or that are cheap projects. So sometimes those referrals are not about building the love, and it's for other reasons. Right, so making sure that they are recommending you to the qualified engagements and bringing you to projects that they know that you have value and that your value is aligned with this particular project. Um, so they will bring you along if you build the love. Um, obviously, I just said that. And this is the important one. They'll get, they'll be solid and qualified leads. So again, it's not about just willy-nilly leads where they're recommending you to their, I don't know, to the CEO for their wedding invitation. You know, it's really very qualified leads. And a lot of it's about knowing that who you are. If you know your vision and you express that vision, then they know how to talk about you as well. If you're always talking about budgets or you're always talking about schedules or if you're always complaining about things, they're going to refer you in a different kind of light. Right, so making sure that you're communicating who you are so they know what to say about you. Right, so you have to give them talking points. If you don't know how to talk about yourself, how are they gonna talk about yourself? Right, how are they gonna tell you if they don't know? Um, and here's a big one, and I'm sure a lot of you, I know that a lot of my clients are like this. You're the only one they're considering. Then you know you built the love. You're not competing against anybody else. It's not about price, it's not even about your work. They just want to work with you and they're going to figure it out. They know you're the perfect person for you. Then you know you've built the love, right? And they will work with you on price. So if you're too low, they're going to say to you, hey, you're too low. We're a pain in the neck. Price a little higher. If you built the love and they love you and they will be your advocate, they will even tell you when your price is too low. These are all signs that you're building the love. If none of these signs are showing up, then you're doing something wrong. It's not the client's fault. Right? So a lot of times I think the clients who are more open to talking about numbers, there's something that you've done to encourage them to feel like it's an open conversation rather than a negotiation. It's just a conversation. And here's a big one and we love these kind of clients, right? They ask for our opinion, and they value it. If they just tell you what to do, hey, I need this website, then maybe you haven't built the love. Maybe it's they don't need a website. So if you're expressing your value and telling them what your expertise is and showing that expertise through metrics and through being an expert in a particular, particular industry, you're helping them build the love because they say, you know my industry so well and you have very clear recommendations, I'm gonna listen to you because you are, you are trustworthy and you are value and you're an expert, right? So those kind of clients are awesome and very hard to find, right? And a lot of times it's because we're all so busy with our lives. Um, one thing I would say to you is, uh, with new business, if a client doesn't immediately respond, so whenever you write a proposal, have you ever had this where the client needs it the next day? And then they say we're making a decision the day after that and then the decision happens like three months later? Don't be mad. You know, you get all, you take it personally, you get really mad. Our lives get busy. They have the best intentions. So forgive their mistakes, forgive that they have flaws, and just say, hey, I know you're busy, let me know when you're making a decision so I don't nag you, right? So being honest with clients and don't making assumptions that you didn't win just because they didn't call you. They simply might be just so busy, right? And if you built the love and they still don't want to work with you for some other reason, they have to work with somebody other design firm that their CEO loves, you know, or something like that. They will call you back and tell you because you built the love. They will tell you why you didn't win the project. And you want to learn those things because that helps you get better in the future. Um, and for staff, staff may will leave you, and they will leave you. Um, actually, it's a really funny story. My daughter's company, they possibly want to work with me. Uh, so they called me up, and uh, I know too many things about them. That's not good. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I can be too neutral. But they were um, calling me up, and their big complaint, their biggest complaint was, oh, millennials, they stay only a year or two. Right? And I'm like, but they might come back. They might turn in clients. You don't never know where they're going to be. So don't give up on them. They might stay longer if you built love. If, instead of you going to the beach and coming back to work, maybe you go to the beach for the day. Maybe they don't need yoga. 
Maybe they don't need to work 12 hour days, right? So it's really thinking about um, doing things for your staff that they will then love you and continue to talk about you afterwards, right? Because they'll recommend their friends, they might, and I've seen this happen, where they leave because they have to leave. They have new opportunities, they want to do new work, they want to work with larger teams or different kinds of brands, but then they realize how much they love you and they'll come back. I've seen staff come back after years of trying new things and saying, I really love this company, I miss them, right? So they will come back or they will recommend friends, or they will just spread good words. How many of you, so designers, we're all gossip hounds, right? We all talk about each other behind their back. I'm like gossip central, uh, <laughs> which is very hard. Uh, but I am, right? Um, and we all know those firms that have bad reputations, right? I can list them like 10 of them off my top of my head. I'm not going to, but. We all know who treat their staff badly, or who work them really long hours, or who treat them like a pair of hands and don't, treat them, don't train them, because the word spreads. You were a very little small, little incestuous little group of us, you know, across the country, we all know everybody else, right? I was actually in Portland, Oregon, shopping in a, design, in a store, because I went to stores that designers recommended. So of course, who do I run into but a New York client? Right, they're everywhere. And you just run into people, and you have to stay in touch with those people and remember who they are. I'm sort of rambling again. <laughs> um, and potential clients will come running to you. If you are just a great person and have a lot of energy or really doing great work and really happy with the work you're doing and expressing that love, staff are gonna come to you in, in like buckets, right? They're not, you don't have to go out and get them because they wanna come and work for you. So again, if you're a teacher, that's really great. You're making connections with your, your, your uh, students. That's building love as long as you're a good teacher. Um, and staff will spread the word about your firm. So, but there are some challenges with love. A lot, actually. Um, you might price too low because you love what you do. Or you are such good people that you want to work for everybody in the world, especially any nonprofit or any any you know cause that is helping the environment and politics and all these like we are good people and we all want to work for nonprofits. There's not I'm gonna promise guarantee there's not anybody in this room who doesn't say I love working with nonprofits. But they're a pain in the ass. Oh, Douglas maybe. <laughs> That's because you've been in the industry, you know, you know now. Uh, but I think a lot of designers, we have a tendency to get so excited about a project and fall in love with a project or fall in love with a client that we allow ourselves to price too low. So be careful of the trap of being sort of the abused husband or wife, right? It's don't be the abused um, design firm. Build the love, but not to the point where you're being taken advantage of because you love them too much. Um, and or you fall in love with a client and you do work that really doesn't fit your vision and takes your business in a different direction, right? So you have to stay true to your vision because if you get distracted and it doesn't align with your vision, that's gonna take you somewhere else. And that might be okay. So it might be okay that you wanna pivot because it's a really cool opportunity and it's something that you're excited about, then try it. But don't allow it to just drive your direction if you in the end decide that that's not the right project for you. Does that make sense, right? So it's really about making sure that you're staying true to who you are and not just taking on staff or um, clients that are just not appropriate. So have you ever interviewed somebody and fell in love with them as a person and then you hired them? Or you've gone for an interview and you love them as people but then you get, you get there and you're like, they're completely different people, right? So that's the only problem with building love is that they might be lovable but a completely different person when you meet them. So there is a little danger in that. Um, or you cross the line from personal, from professional to personal. Too much socializing with your clients, too much drinking, right? I've seen that happen. So there's a fine line. You wanna be friends with them, but not too much that you know everything about them and they know everything about you. Um, and you will be taken advantage of or allow yourself to be. So there are some disadvantages. And love, when given freely, will duplicate. Other people will talk about how loving you are and they will express love to you as well. 
And uh, the, the other thing I think I'd leave, leave you with this last statement, which is that it's all about your actions rather than the words. So you can write all the kind of statements you want about how great your firm is, but if you don't believe it, and if you don't communicate that, then you're not really helping yourself. So it's really, spend, designers like to spend a lot of time doing stuff, like designing their website, figuring out their positioning, you know, like uh, designing some wine bottle. But spend that time, <laughs> it's true, spend, or posters, or pens, or notebooks, can I list everything here? Um, spend more time just building one-to-one -one relationships and less time designing shit. <laughs> but no one's going to remember, and it's only ephemeral. So actions speak louder than words. Do it rather than just tell them. There's my book. Uh, thank you. So they're prepared. So this goes back to me telling people, look, I might make you cry, but it's with love. And so when I make them cry, <laughs> which has happened, I apologize and say, look, I might have gone a little bit too far, right? Um, but if you build the love, they'll come back. So I think if they're, if they're sensitive, you have to be, a, um, pay attention to that and know not to say anything that's personally driven and not to attack, never to attack. And again, this is not about finger pointing, right? So if you, as long as you don't blame them, they will be less defensive and less like uh, nervous about what you're saying about them. But again, if you've made them look good, then it'll help. So um, I have an example of a, I had a client, a client for a long time, like 15 years I've worked with them, and it became a little abusive. I was starting to take advantage of that client because we were becoming too close. And we started being more like brother and sister, does it make sense? And so I was saying things that were probably not appropriate. Uh, and he fired me, right? Awesome. I was really happy, and he was really happy. We stayed in touch for two years. We understood why that needed to happen. We had grown apart, and he'd been with me a really long time, and that's okay. Clients don't have to last a lifetime. But then two years later, he came back, right? Because they, we still stayed in touch. I still cared about his business. I shared in his successes his business. We stayed in touch. We were never enemies. I was never took. I never took it personally. In fact, I agreed with it. So that completely didn't answer your question. But <laughs> did that help? I don't know if it helped. What else? Oh, Natalia, no. Who's your ideal client? My ideal client. Or your piece. Yeah, um, I think it's somebody that, first of all, that I like. For, I mean, it's an interesting question, Matthew. Okay, so it's um, somebody that fits my vision. So I have like certain kinds of clients I work for now. So I'm looking for a size, how long they've been in business. Um, so I have very clear qualifiers. Like I don't want to work with anybody who's just been in business for less than a year, because I'm not really into training people. I want to take their business to the next level. So I know myself that I'll lose patience with people who don't know a lot. Like I want to work with smart, smart people because I want to learn from them. So I think I choose people based on smartness and also they have to do damn good work, right? So I really, I mean, then there's no way for me to, it's just objective, like subjective. Like I just need to know they do good work. Yeah, and if they're just nice people. And because we all know each other, I know who's not nice and who is, <laughs> right? We all know each other and we've heard rumors. Matter of fact, I had a client, uh, I heard a rumor about, so they had hired, one of my other clients had hired a staff from one of my other clients. And so that, it's hard to explain, okay. So firm A was hiring um, a staff member from firm B. And firm A said, this staff member said all these terrible things about firm B, which is my client, both of my clients. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So I had the dilemma, do I tell my client? I heard all these things. It was just from one person, and it was sort of like word of mouth, right? But I wanted to know, like, were these things true? So I eventually did say it. And I said, look, I don't know if this is true, 
but and I don't know who said it, but I, and I think it could just be one person. There could be a lot of different perspectives. But I want to tell you, these things are being spread, and there must be something, something there that communicated that. What happened? I didn't know. I didn't want to make. I didn't mention who the person was, but I, I thought it was really important to, to communicate that. So I was being honest. That's an ethical dilemma, right? I wasn't sure if I should have done it. They appreciated it so much. They were so grateful for me to talk about it because they didn't realize those messages were being sent out. And it was a very, um, it was sort of a misunderstanding that it happened, but there was something that they didn't kind of end well, and they should have ended it better. So a lesson learned for them. Next question. Oh, so many questions here. I'll go to you, Scott, on that side. Hi. You're a graphic designer. What a surprise. <laughs> So he said, he's, he's something about a friend, tell me what he's, it's an awesome client, and then what? We have an awesome collaboration. Awesome collaboration, yep. Then you follow Oh, so you referred other clients to you? Yeah. Okay. Yes, they're going to hear about it. Yeah. 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 Well, first of all, okay. I'm. Can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So basically, he's being referred to clients, and they are paying less than the first client that recommended them. And will that person hear back? How does that work? First of all, every project's different, and they all have different prices. So if you're pricing based on what the project is worth, even if it's lower, that's fine. Because if the client hears that, they can say, why, you know, they might have an honest conversation and say, why is your price lower? My friend told me you work with us. You can say, because the project is different. And here's the difference. It's less pages, or it's not a complicated website. It's a completely, it's like a WordPress versus, you know, you know, whatever. So you can explain it if you have to. Um, but I think that's a really good concern, because people, clients will talk to each other. But again, this is about making sure that you're not pricing too low in the first place. That Because you know, as soon as you start pricing at one number, it's not... It's, it's sometimes easy to creep down, and what you want to do is creep up. And so you just have to be careful of that, and price, just price authentically to yourself and based on the value of the project, and not be doing it cheap. Like, you should never do anything that's gonna hurt your pricing at all. That's what, again, staying true to your value, like thinking about Snapper right now. Like, what is our, what's the minimum, I always believe in pricing, which is a whole other talk, which is to have your minimum engagement. I don't work for less than this, right? So I had a client just call me up, a brand new client who said, I just want a phone call, all I need is one phone call. I said, I'd do the phone call, but my minimum fee is this, which is a lot of money. And they're like, but I just want a phone call. I said, well, this is my minimum. I don't work with people for less, you know, so what do you want to do, right? And that shows confidence in who I am and how precious my time is and that I want long-term clients. I don't want somebody who's calling me every you know, few months with an hour question. Right, so it's about being true to yourself and pricing accordingly. Scott? Yeah, I have a question about um, referrals and asking for referrals. Oh, yeah. So asking about, a question about asking for referrals. Yeah, how do you have a particular strategy? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, so he feels uncomfortable asking for referrals. Like, I don't think anybody is, you know, not uncomfortable with that. First of all, if you build the love, they should naturally refer you. But, I'll give you an example. I work with heads of state. I'm gonna just tell them the name of who I, so I, swear, I work with Dusty and Jason, and I've been with them for six years. I've helped their business tremendously. I love them deeply. They love me. It's mutual love, uh, I hope. And another design firm, Post Typography, called them up and said, hey, we were similar business. We'd love to hear about your business strategy. So they talked, and Dusty, Dusty called me up and goes, you'd be so proud of me, I told Post Typography, post typography, all these business strategies and all this stuff. I'm like, that's really great. But he never mentioned my name. So I got off the phone, I'm like, damn, what do I do? Right? He, why didn't he mention my name? So I just called him up and I used humor. You know, like I just made it a joke to say, hey, hey, did you ever think about mentioning my name? Like, you know, it would be really cool because I'm pretty one who taught you all this stuff. And he's like, oh shit. He just, 
He didn't do it for any other reason that they just didn't think. Now post hoc hiring is a client, right? Because I, I had to ask. I think you have to also wait for those moments that are appropriate. You shouldn't be greedy, right? You don't, shouldn't say, hey, refer me, but if you see an opportunity, if they know somebody, you can say, hey, I know you know blah, blah, blah. I've always wanted to work with them. I think that you know, their business is really interesting. I think it aligns with my business. If you ever have an opportunity to introduce me, I would love that. Only when it's, so he's asking when the time is. First of all, it's, there's no easy answer for that other than to say not to be aggressive and to write for the right moment. So if the project is immediately over and there's a right moment, then ask for it. If you think, you, like they're going to a conference and they're speaking, and you can say, hey, if you happen to mention me on stage, I'd love it, you know, you could joke. You know what I mean? Like, so if there's a moment, but if there's not, don't do it. I think that's more of a gut instinct. Um, mostly, though, you shouldn't really ask for referrals. They should be given to you. Um, but if you see an opportunity, like you shouldn't say, hey, give me 10 referrals, unless you did it for free. Then you can say, well, for free, I want 10 referrals. <laughs> but just say, hey, I know you're involved in this community. If you ever you know, know other firms that could use design, that's how I you know, get my work, and that's how I build the love. Right? So I think it's about just making sure there's a right opportunity if they know the right person, if they're going to an event or they're you know, writing an article or something like that. Because a lot of times people don't refer you, not because they're mean, they just don't think. So sometimes you have to remind them, this is also about staying in touch. Is staying in touch. If you're, people are forgettable. They're all forgettable. I always think I'm not forgettable. I'm kind of annoying and loud and you know, I have a certain look. And I always think people are going to forget about me. Uh, not forget about me. And I remember one time I was speaking at an AIJ event, I was moderating a big conference, and I was just a moderator. I wasn't even a speaker. Um, and there were a bunch of past clients in the room, and they all came up to me afterwards, and they're like, and they, these were people that worked with me at one point, but had stopped working with me, and they're like, I forgot about you, I wanna work with you again. Like, how do you forget about people you work with? But they do, and it was my bad for not staying in touch with them. Right? So staying in touch with people, reminding them they're out there and that you're doing cool work and that you're an interesting person, they will then refer you. So it's more about staying in touch than asking for referrals. And then when you're asked, when you stay in touch, wait, wait for that right moment. And I don't know when that right moment it is different each time. Douglas? CRM uh, is a customer relationship management tool. You know, I was really happy with what you did. Never say that it didn't go well. <laughs> um, I believe in that, and not only that, Douglas, and I make some of my clients do this, I don't think I've made you do this, is you'll call your competitors that won the project and wish them well, right? So I don't call people my enemy or my, well, I'm one person that's my arch enemy. <laughs> <laughs> my husband called him that, he's my arch enemy. Uh, but now he's sort of a friend. Uh, so if you, first of all, we're all friends, right? We are not competitors. We should be really happy that we're all winning projects against people that we know are doing good work, right? So if somebody wins it that you admire, call them up and say, hey, you won this project. You know, I was up against it. I'm really glad you won it because I know you'll do a great job. Congratulations. And they will then recommend clients to you sometimes if they're too busy, right? So meeting your competitors and being friends with them rather than enemies so much better, right? So much better, you can talk about pricing, right? So you don't have to compete about pricing, you can just compete about the quality of your work. So if my clients are up against each other, I will get their permission to talk to them and say, hey, do you mind? I know who else is working on this, do you wanna to talk to them? I do this all the time. If, they get, if I get permission from both persons. And then they talk to each other, it's great. Because then they're like, let's not, let's, sometimes they talk about price, Sometimes they don't, but they both care about each other and wish each other well, and it's nice to know what other people are thinking. Or maybe they heard something different from a client that they didn't hear. 
So let's level set the competitive environment. So we're pricing, we're based on quality of our work and, uh, and just if we're nice people, rather than on our price. So sometimes I do that. So I, I, if that answers your question, I definitely think that. I think staying in touch with people, and even if they don't select you, if you've built the love, they'll come back. Also, sometimes if we're just too high for them, because they're just starting off in their business, they might come back. And I know, Louise, you had that, where somebody else designed a package that didn't know how to design food packaging. They came back to you years later. Right? That happened. I remember that. Right? It happened. Sometimes they'll come back to you if they went to a bad designer, or they realized it wasn't successful, or they went to a designer that was an expert in that space. So staying in touch with people so they don't forget you is really important. What other questions? your prima donna. Yes. So basically, there are people that have succeeded and who have very successful business, but are not nice people, and we know that. And they, you know, and is there something to it? They're not doing anything what I say, and they're doing the opposite, opposite right? Um, and we can name a bunch of people, right, easily. Um, wait, Douglas, are you mentioning names already? <laughs> I heard some mumbling. <laughs> um, that's the prima donna part. I do think there is something to being this kind of known personality. I'm good at name, James Victoria. Right, I love James, he's a friend of mine and he was a client, but he has a certain prima donna quality that works for him, right? And that's okay. I still think he builds the love, but in a different way. So I think um, prima donna, being that prima donna is still, as long as you're not a, yeah, I think it's tricky. I, I, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think it was, it was tough for me because I moved to New York and there was this sense that here you have to be really tough. And early employers couldn't have been too nice. Yeah. It's not a problem now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also think it's a generational thing, right? It was, it was, uh, there was a sense that we had to be something. Yeah. You know, hey, Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I don't think that's true anymore. I think the environment's changed. I think that a lot to do with the younger generation. I think they're just so much nicer people than we were ever, and they were more confident, and they care about things like business rather than just design. So I think they're behaving differently than we used to, and I don't think that's acceptable behavior as much as it once was. Um, there's gonna be exceptions to the rule. Also, if you are famous enough, like if you do great work, then you could be more of an asshole. <laughs> right? So a lot of those people that were like that, I think because they were doing such amazing, well-known work. But if you look at their work now, not so amazing anymore because they're living off their laurels. Not James, but you know, there are other people. So, what are the questions? Yeah, I like random questions. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, so that's building the love, right? Yeah. That, oh, I have to repeat the question. Mateo is my like <laughs> monitor here. Um, what happens if a client has too much money? Do you tell them? Right? Basically? If they have too much money? Oh, if my client, actual my client, overpriced? Oh, of course I'll tell them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, most designers don't price too high. <laughs> so it's not as much of an issue because they're constantly undervaluing themselves. I always have to push them higher. But I have a few clients that price way too high. And I'll let them know that I think their price is too high. But if they get away with it and they feel confident in the number, I'll believe it. If they believe it and they're not just doing it to be evil. Although I do believe in the aggravation factor. So the more aggravation factor the client is, like the more red flags, the higher you can price. So I always say the more red flags, for every red flag you increase your price by 10%. So if their price is too high because the client has a lot of red flags, I'll support it completely. So, yeah. So I have a few Only one. 
we're just talking about everything here. Okay, flat fee versus hourly. Yes. So does users' rights apply to design? Oh, we're not talking about all that today. <laughs> <laughs> See me being honest? Read my book. <laughs> really, honestly, it's in all that. Honestly, I think pricing is a whole other conversation. Um, so yeah, but I, can you pick one of the best questions that you think you want? Uh, never charge hourly, there you go. <laughs> hourly is, for, as, there's exceptions. So if you have a client that's a pain in the neck, and you've worked with before, and who keeps you on the phone all the time, and just has endless revisions that might be an hourly thing, but for the most part, hourly positions you like a plumber or a vendor, and they treat you badly. And they'll be like, that doesn't take that many hours. Why is it taking that many hours? And it also just is more like, so there's that famous Paula Cher story. Does anybody know about that with the napkin? So Citibank, uh, she was in a meeting, and she was, Citibank was merging with Travelers. She was in a co like having coffee, and, and they were talking about the merger, and on a napkin she was drawing the city logo with the umbrella over the eye. She did that in like five seconds. Did she charge for five seconds of her time? I'm pretty sure not. Right, so always think about that when you're thinking about time. Question, other questions? No more pricing questions, I'm just gonna say. <laughs> oh, did you have a pricing question? Well, it's sort of related. Um, <laughs> do you need a certain point for business? Yes. Okay, so the question is, do you have to hire to, to grow? So my question, my, my answer to that is simple, is if you're a one-person firm, solopreneur, it's very hard to do everything for your, that your business needs, right? You're so in the weeds, designing and managing, you're not growing your business, you're not thinking about the structure of the business, the process, you know, about doing your business, you do, don't have time and you'll never, look, I'm a one-person firm, but I've also not, wanting to be rich. Like, I don't want to be like, I, I like where I am and I'm not going to grow. I've chosen not to grow financially, but if you want to grow financially, you have to hire at least one person when you're a one person firm, um, because you need somebody else to do the design and do the stuff that even though you love to do, you shouldn't be doing, so you can get business and you can pay attention to your business. Doesn't mean that once you have two people that you have to grow any further. This goes back to your vision. You hire based on your vision rather than the latest fire. Are you planning on hiring? Well, I guess the follow-up question would be, do you think one person is in charge of acquisition? In charge of acquisition? Well, you just mentioned uh, one person is hiring and the other person is designing. Yes, uh, acquisition. <laughs> I've not heard that word for new business. You said it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, did I say acquisition? Did I really? Yeah. Um, yes, I think it's your job as a principal to sell your business. Um, nobody else can do it, not a salesperson. It has to be you. Because you know why? Because you love what you do. And that love is going to shine through in how you talk about the work. Nobody else can show that love as much as you. Nobody else. Uh, Carol, how are we doing on time? Carol's not here. Keep going. Keep going, okay. <laughs> hi. Oh, you are? What's your name? Bobby. Oh, yeah, hi, Bobby. <laughs> FIT, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about RFPs. I guess I have a tendency to have those kinds of questions because I know everything. I think I know everything. Um, RFPs, when to go after them, how do you know if you should do them? Yeah, like how do you hear about them? Is that a don't do them, then you don't have to hear about them. <laughs> That's the answer. I mean, RFPs are really, really, really hard to win if they're official RFPs, of course, proposals that are like 30 page documents where 20 other people are bidding against it and you can't meet with the person. For the most part, those are unwinnable because always when they do RFPs, almost always, they already know who they want to work with, but they have to send an RFP out because they're required to, even though they know who they're going to pick. And if you're that person, that, then you should write that RFP. If you know that you can get the job, or you have a good relationship with them, or if you met them in person, that's when you do the RFP. Uh, you don't just, there's RFP sites. Like if you're doing certain kind of work, like signage and wayfinding is a perfect example, that's all RFP driven. So like, I think 212 Associates is a perfect example. They do mostly signage and wayfinding. And they have people that all day long 
are responding to RFPs. That's their full-time job. Because that's how they get work. That's the only way they can get work. Right? But otherwise, RFPs are just not. Every once in a while, if it's like, it's a risk, you want to do it, then do it. Like I always tell my clients, one RFP a year, I'm happy. <laughs> like I'll support you doing one RFP, but if you do more, I'm not going to support you as much. Honestly, because I think that there are people, you, just, you put all this love and all this work into those RFPs, like so much work, and then you don't win it, and you get so bummed, and then it just, you're bummed for years, and I can't do anything to help you, because you just like lost one RFP that you spent all your time, you know what I mean? Like Anything that takes longer to write a proposal than it is to do the project, I wouldn't do. <laughs> right? Anything in this room? Yeah. Hi. So she's talking about she tries sometimes to avoid meeting with clients in person because she seems she might appear young and inexperienced, even though she's confident in her work, her own work, being a one person or a small firm, a new firm, and also being a young woman. Right. So I would say you own it. I'd rather you own it and just tell them, like, hey, I might appear young, but I have a world of experience and here's all my metrics. Like, I think I, I encountered that when I was younger. First of all, I changed my title. That helps a lot. Like, you just make your title a little more impressive. Um, and it's also showing confidence. If you're a confident young woman, then they won't look at your age as much. There's a lot of sexism, too. You can't avoid that. But for that most part, I think you have to, like, get over that. And I think that's your own issue you have to kind of resolve. Like, I think a lot of times, I've had clients who've told me this, that they feel like clients are judging them. But I'm like, has anybody actually said that to you? Yeah. Yeah. But do you want to work with them? Yeah. Yeah, so she was saying with older, more, you know, older men, they sometimes would treat her like younger. Well, I'm just going to say, like, maybe they're not the kind of client you want to work for anyway. Right, so you have to pick the clients. There's some clients that are so worth it. I'm gonna give you permission to fire some clients and to not work with everybody. There's some people that are just not, you wanna work with anyway. If they're gonna disrespect you because of your age, look, if you're young and you're not doing good work, then that's a problem. But if you're doing great work and you can prove that you're doing great work through metrics and through success stories, not through just testimonials, then you could be a young designer. Yeah, there are amazing, some amazing people that are right out of college that are like awesome. But most of them are not and they think they are. Okay, one more question. Oh, we might not have any. Yeah. So yeah, that happens a lot. When you work with somebody and then all of a sudden they leave and somebody else who you don't like replaces them. Are they still in the same company? So basically, okay, so her main contact got promoted and now she works with, he left. But he's still recommending the other guy to work with you? No, the CEO is recommending the new point of contact. Oh, OK. Well, do you like the CEO? Yeah. OK, so the CEO is recommending her to a new point of contact that the new point of contact she doesn't like so much. Um, first of all, you should talk to that new contact and see if you can fix the relationship. I had a client that uh, it was such a difficult relationship. We were just always fighting, always fighting. Like, it was just not a good relationship. And I was trying to figure out why. Like I couldn't, and I just said, hey, you know, 
something's going on. I feel like we're both angry at each other. What, what's going on? She's like, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I feel the same way. And then we looked deeper and we realized we were both strong, kind of very strong women and very kind of, we were the same person. And we realized that and we looked, we thought about new ways of working together. And now we're very conscious of that behavior. So there are people that are open to hearing that. So not saying, hey, you're an asshole, but saying, hey, I'm struggling with some issues. And again, not finger pointing. But the situation's different. Like, I have a different situation than I had with the person I worked with before. I'd love to talk to you about new ways of thinking about working. First of all, you should give them the opportunity to change. Um, and then make some harder decisions on your own part to see if it's worth quitting or worth seeking like other advice. Like, if there are other people that work well with somebody, you can ask them, well, how do you work with them? What am I doing that I can help work with this person better? But if they're treating badly, you never take bad behavior. Like if they're terrible human beings, you just don't tolerate that, right? Sometimes you can get upper ups to support you, but that's very tricky, right? But if they love you and they're your advocate, they wanna protect you. So if you're having trouble with somebody they hire, you might wanna say, hey, I know you love this person, but I'm having difficulty. I would love some advice on how to better work with this person and they might help you if they love you. So if this guy is recommending you to people, he might be able to tell you, here's some ways to work with him. Yeah, okay, good. Well, have a good day. Yeah.